Hi, everyone. This is just a little friendly reminder to sign up for our big public event coming up December 1st through 3rd, Friday night open house at the Skeptic Society offices right here, Saturday all-day events, and then on Sunday, a special event uh, podcast recording live with a studio audience, that's you, uh, with Jared Diamond. And as you know, Jared is the author of the Pulitzer Prize winning book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, as well as the sequels to that, Collapse, uh, and a a whole bunch of other great titles uh, having to do with what life was like before the modern world, and what we can learn from that. And so we'll be talking about um, Jared's uh, lifelong career. He's in his 80s now, and he has had the most fascinating career. Uh, So we'll be talking about that and skepticism and science and uh, whatever else comes up in the conversation, which is kind of the fun part of having a podcast like this, in which you will be participating in this recorded live, and then we will post it on the podcast platform, which reaches about 100,000 people each episode. Uh, so you'll be part of that. So that's going to be super cool. So sign up right now. Go to skeptic.com and uh, just click on the banner there for the conference and uh, and get your, get your tickets now. It's probably going to sell out. Also, we have a special uh, Saturday night fundraising dinner for the Skeptic Society. So uh, I would appreciate your support for that as well. This is what in part fuels and funds our efforts here. All right, good. I'll see you soon. And uh, thanks for listening. My guest is Matthew Dalek, a political historian whose intellectual interests include the intersection of social crises and political transformation the evolution of the modern conservative movement, and liberalism and its critics. We can also get into that, but we're going to focus on the uh, conservative movement for most of this conversation. Dalek has authored or co-authored four books, including most recently this one, Birchers, How the John Birch Society Radicalized the American Right. His other books include Defenseless Under the Night, The Roosevelt Years and the Origins of Homeland Security, which won the Henry Adams Prize from the Society for the History in for history in the federal government, the right move moment, Ronald Reagan's first victory and the decisive turning point in American politics, which appeared on the Washington Post and the Chicago Tribune's annual best of lists, and inside campaigns, elections through the eyes of political professionals. Dalek is a frequent commentator in the national news media on politics, history, and public affairs. His articles and reviews have appeared in the Washington Post, Politico, The Atlantic, Perspectives, and the Journal of Policy History. And his commentary has been heard on NPR, CNN International, and MSNBC. And he also worked as a speechwriter for House Minority Leader Richard Dick Gebhardt. All right. Hello, Matthew. You know, Matthew, I I did not realize who your father was until I already read the book, and I was just making some show notes, and I saw the dedication of your book wow. to your father. It's like, oh, he's yeah. that Dalek, the famous yeah, that- Robert Dalek, of course. <laughs> yes, yes, and uh, and I grew up in Los Angeles, of course, because my dad taught uh, at UCLA for three decades. Right, that's right. I think he was department chair there for a while. But of course, my my readers and and listeners here will know him from if you just Google his name and his image pop. up. Oh, that guy! I've seen him on all those talk shows. <laughs> <They might laughs> I was just watching last shelf. night. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I I would hope so. Yeah. Now, he was I was watching the one uh, his appearance on Charlie Rose last night where he was talking about the uh Nixon and Kissinger book. What a fascinating uh interesting relationship that was. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, I remember actually when he went on Charlie Rose uh before uh Charlie Rose uh, uh had it when he had a show. Meltdown, right? yes. Yes. <laughs> when he had a show. Yeah, I was on his show for my first book, White People Believe Weird Things. Yeah, it was a weird studio because it's super dark and everything's black and you're just it's like floating heads around a table. <laughs> it's really funny, especially cool- if you wear a black suit, yeah. which I tended to do at the time. The coolest thing was uh, my dad once went on John Stewart back when Stewart was hosting The Daily Show. And uh, it was great. I got to be in the audience with one of my cousins. Oh, nice. I'm sure my mom was there. We were in the front row. That was uh, That was an experience. <laughs> that was very cool. Right, so let's start there. Just tell us what it was like growing up with a world-class, world-famous historian and how that influenced your own work. Yeah, well, uh, it was nice because uh, I grew up in L.A. and my dad uh, had a, a, a nice study in the backyard. And so when my sister and I uh, came home from school, he was often there. 
uh, working on uh, on one of his books. I think he's written 15 of them. So he's very productive. Uh, But what was nice nice in part is that uh, he uh, would always make time for us. So, you know, we would come home and he would uh, uh, throw the baseball with me uh, at like 3.30 and, uh, and so, um, you know, I knew he worked very hard. I knew he was very devoted to his work. I knew that he had a, a real passion for, uh, American political history. Uh, but you know, he, people who have met him know how down to earth he is, right? And know, uh, he's really menschy, right? To use a term and he's very funny. Um, and he was an incredibly popular teacher at UCLA, uh, and, uh, uh, justifiably so, he he won awards, and so, um, you know, I uh, I admired him. I was uh, I think inspired by the work that he did and kind of his model of scholarship. Um, you know, we can talk about my my path. I mean, I uh, I went into speech writing after getting a PhD in history, in part because I wanted to try something different for a few years, and I did that. Um, and, you know, I kind of have charted out my, my own path a bit, even though it's similar <laughs> to what my dad does. But, uh, but yeah, it, it was, uh, it was great, uh, growing up with, with my parents. Yeah. And what was it like working for Dick Gebhardt? I mean, he, didn't he run for president a couple of times or at least one? He ran twice. He ran twice. Wow. I was not involved in either campaign. He did, uh, quite well in 1988 in Iowa. I think he won the Iowa caucuses. Um, and uh, was profiled in What It Takes, the famous uh, book by Richard Ben Kramer, uh, if memory serves. Uh, but I was not involved in either presidential campaign. His other one was in 2004. Uh, I worked uh, for him for about two and a half years uh, as a, basically a, a speech writer. And uh, I was in the leadership office, so we had an office in the Capitol building. It was my first, uh, uh, really, an, an major experience working directly in politics. Uh, and I was uh, there during the Gore v. Bush recount. I oh, was wow. there. I was in the Capitol building, 100 feet from the rotunda in my office on the morning of uh, September 11th, 2001. Oh, wow. And we were, of course, evacuated in a very chaotic way. And Gephardt was, uh, um, you know, he was really a, a, a great person to work for uh, in politics. And the thing is, his staff was very experienced. I mean, a lot of them had worked for leadership, Democratic leadership, either in the House or Senate. And um, I think most of them felt like Gephardt uh, was the the kind of apex, right? Because he was a very decent, you know, obviously a lot of people disagree with him politically, but people really love working for him. He never said an unkind word to anyone. He was always very even keeled, um, very reasonable. And uh, and quite effective politically. He was in Democratic House leadership for, uh, I think, at least 15 years, maybe 20 years. So uh, it, it was uh, uh, personally, it was you know satisfying to work for someone who I who I liked and admired. Uh, and I got to draft uh, 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 speeches and, and press conference statements on every issue under the sun. And that was another fascinating kind of window into uh, into not just Capitol Hill, but national and international American politics. When we see that, uh, I mean, we all know that, that politicians have speechwriters, but did they at least uh, read through it carefully and edit it and make changes and go back and forth? So I kind of feel like I'm getting the politician's thoughts and not just some speechwriter's thoughts? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's, first of all, <laughs> it's almost always a collaboration. And by the way, it's not simply a collaboration with the elected official. It's also a collaboration with my colleagues, his other staff members. Mm. Um, remember, you know, Gephardt, by the time I went to work for him, he had been in Congress for 25 years and had been in leadership, as I said, for more than a decade. So he had a pretty well-established track record on a lot of issues. And so, you know, you were never going to draft a, a speech that was totally at odds or foreign with, you know, positions he had taken. Uh, and so uh, the idea was to, um, depending on the event, uh, try to produce at least a first draft that reflected his views, uh, his uh, his approach, the way he liked to speak about an issue, uh, to make it, you know, both personal to him, but also reflective of, of the Democratic Party and the caucus. And 
certainly for the bigger speeches, uh, he would have a, a, a significant and direct role. Um, if it was a, a press conference statement, you know, sure, he would review it. But, you know, sometimes uh, the staff would also be uh, uh, heavily involved. And so it really just depended on the and remember, because uh, in part he was a Democratic leader, and this was even pre-Twitter, but, you know, we still have the, the Internet in 2002, 2001, and, uh, and it, was, uh, it was still pretty fast-paced. So there were some days where he was producing multiple statements on a variety of issues, from Yucca Mountain to um, airplane safety uh, to uh, 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 arsenic in the drinking water, just, you know, to cite three <laughs> examples. Interesting. Yeah, you always wonder about those classic turns of phrases that presidents have. You know, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Did Kennedy really write that or did some really good speechwriter write that and then he signed off on it? <laughs> well, Ted Sorensen was uh, uh, John F. Kennedy's uh, really top speechwriter and unusual, I think, in history in that he and Kennedy had really uh, a bonded, had a sort of mind meld and had worked together mm -hmm. closely for many years. And um, there's actually a book, which I have not read, but it's supposed to be quite good uh, on, I believe, on Kennedy's inaugural speech, a whole book dedicated to it. So uh, listeners should <laughs> definitely read the book. My sense is that um, this was a, a Sorensen phrase, but also something that clearly emerged from Kennedy as well. And uh, and again, if memory serves, Kennedy's inaugural speech, quite famous speech, in part uh, flowed out of things that he had been saying for, for the prior year or two. So it was a collaboration, as you know, many uh, speeches are, of course. I guess now it'll just be, dear chat GPT, please write me a speech about uh, uh, about lead poisoning in the water or whatever. And then yeah. it scrapes through all your past writings and puts together something pretty good. <laughs> just make sure it's not plagiarized from someone else's speech. <laughs> Right. Ah, right. Yes. Yes. Right. So I do, I do suspect that these engineers will program algorithms to scan the chat GPT produced content for that kind of thing. Like that didn't come from your guys, uh, uh yeah. thoughts that came from somebody else. Oh, let's hope. Let's hope. <laughs> and that of course does happen also. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So when your publisher, uh, sent me your book, uh, I thought, oh, this will be a fun kind of slice of history that's not really relevant anymore. I remember the Birchers. Mm -hmm. uh, they used to have a like a table set up in front of the post office in Altadena where we had our where the mm. original Skeptic Society offices were, and I would go there and, mm. and engage. They they would uh, regale me with their conspiracy theories, which we were always debunking. So that was kind of fun. Mm. But then they yeah. disappeared, and I thought, yeah, I guess they're gone now. Uh, but let me just remind readers, this is not a slice of ancient history that's now gone that there is a, a direct link between the John Birch Society and radical right figures today like Michelle Bachman, Sarah Palin, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Glenn Beck, Alex Jones, Ron Paul, Rand Paul, and of course, Donald Trump. If, if it's not an oxymoron to say, you know, the intellectual origins of Donald Trump, well, here it is, right? Plus COVID denialism, vaccine disinformation, America first nationalism, school board wars, QAnon plots, allegations of electoral cheating, and so on, all goes back to these guys. It's astonishing. Well, yeah, you, you put it very well, which is, um, and, you know, I want to be very careful about sort of describing the argument I attempt to make in the book, which is not that, you know, the Birchers, which, you know, the heyday was in the 1960s. It's not that the Birchers and their ideas were suddenly transplanted uh, or somehow there was a conspiracy on the far right to sort of bring the Birch ideas forward 50 or 60 years. Um, what I'm trying to argue is that, and the Birchers were not the only group to do this, do this America first in the 1930s, many other uh, movements, but the Birch Society is sort of the leading emblem of the radical right in the 1960s, I argue, helped to forge a, uh, a set of ideas, uh, an alternative political tradition on the far right that challenged uh, many figures and ideas on the mainstream right. They also overlapped at times as well, and that they also helped to forge a style that successors picked up on uh, through the decades and, uh, and kept those ideas alive. And so it's really looking at these kind of intellectual 
uh, at least the last third of the book, is looking at these intellectual successors, the people that inherited these ideas that tried to update them and transform them, and also to use them in a more politically savvy uh, way. And, uh, and the in, last thing I'll say is the interesting thing, I think in part, is this question of, well, how do I survive or where do they come from, right? And it's not that Robert Welch, who died in 1985, or, or you know, individual birchers sort of kept alive, you know, and, and became, you know, the president or something like that. But there is a way in which through the books, their magazines, through the media coverage of them, through debates about the Birchers, uh, both from the critics, supporters, and conservatives. There are ways in which I think these ideas continue to bubble along in American politics, and that was what, in part at least, interested me and motivated me to write the book. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned uh, yeah, the American Firsters and Lindbergh. Let's see, that was 1930, mm-hmm. right? Yep. So. Yeah, a lot of these threads go back. By the way, parenthetically, this has come up in several recent podcasts about Charles Lindbergh, in which my guest did not know this fact, that he had an entire secret German family, a wife and mm. children, uh, in Germany <laughs> that didn't come out until the 2000s, uh, after that the big biography of him that was so mm. highly acclaimed. Mm. Berg was yeah. the biographer's name, I yep. think. Scott Berg, yeah. And, uh, but there was, D- yeah, Scott Berg, there was DNA testing, and sure enough, he had the secret family. Yeah. So he was really into the German Aryan <laughs> thing, right? Yeah, well, he was a, a Nazi uh, sympathizer and visited Nazi Germany. Right, yes. and it, Right, admirer of uh, of Goering in the Air Force and all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. So, all right, let's um, let's kind of take a look at the a, a bigger picture of politics to see where this comes from kind of as a natural outflow of the left and the right. I mean, we think of this kind of spectrum um, between the far left and the far right, and most of politics is played between the two 40-yard lines, if you will. Uh, but but yet there's always people pushing it out to the you know, to the 35-yard line or the 30-yard line and and so on. You know, why is it that, that most politics it does kind of break down into this sort of left and right? Is that part of human nature? Is it a product of how political systems are designed? What are your hmm. thoughts on that? That's a really interesting question. Um, well, part of it, I think, is due to the structure of America's two-party system. Um, you know, each party, of course, is uh, a coalition of forces at any given time. And sometimes the coalition combines, for example, uh, the, in the New Deal years, from the New Deal to the Great Society in mid-20th century, and the Democratic Party combined, I think, what would be fairly described as ideas from conservatives of the right, especially on race, right? There were segregationists in the South, as well as uh, much more liberal Northerners and pro-union, pro-government uh, intervention and economic interventions. And so, you know, these two parties are, are amalgamation. Um, and And of course, I would say that what is defined as being of the left or liberal or of the right or, or far right, um, it really shifts, right, depending on the given, a given moment in time. And, uh, and yet, when you have two major parties, um, occasionally, of course, we'll have third parties that come along and will we'll challenge the, the political system. Um, but those parties have never, of course, won, uh, certainly not the presidency, those third parties. Uh, and... Um, and typically, at least in the last century and a half, those third-party challenges, they, their ideas tend to get incorporated into one of the two major parties. And so, um, and so uh, you know, there are a lot of, of course, major flaws in American politics and, and in our democracy. But, uh, and, but one of the flaws and also one of its strengths may be that um, because of the system we have, a lot of political leaders tend to have to, not always, of course, as we've seen more recently, but a lot of times they are uh, uh, pushed toward those kind of in between the 40 yard lines, or at least those pressures still exist. And so, you know, someone like um, Barack Obama, for example, who maybe uh, if, um, you know, he had been sort of king, right, <laughs> he could have done a lot of things that he wanted to do. 
that would have been considered much more left. But he was operating within a system. Um, and then, of course, the balance of powers, right, where, you know, you have Congress and uh, and a president can't just decree something typically. I mean, there are executive orders, but those only go so far. And so um, those checks and balances, I think, also have a, a mitigating effect, I think, for better and worse uh, that um, that push politics, not necessarily toward the center all the time, um, but uh, but do uh, sometimes mitigate uh, uh, because uh, and and then of course the last thing uh, last element potentially is that um, you know we do have a a strange system in which um, the Senate you know states with a population of six hundred thousand uh, like a Vermont or maybe a North Dakota right under a million have uh, the same number of senators of course as California with you know forty million people or whatever it is. And, and that has another kind of constraining effect, I think, on our uh, politics and ideas. Yeah, I'm just pulling up some quotes here I like on this. John Stuart Mill, a party of order or stability and a party of progress or reform are both necessary elements of a healthy state of political life. Then I have another one I use in a lecture from Bertrand Russell. From 600 BC to the present day, philosophers have been divided into those who wish to tighten social bonds and those who wish to relax them. It is clear that each party to this dispute, as to all that persists through long periods of time, is partly right and partly wrong. Social cohesion is a necessity, and mankind has never yet succeeded in enforcing cohesion by merely rational arguments. Every community is exposed to two opposite dangers, ossification through too much discipline and reverence for tradition on the one hand, and on the other hand, disillusion or subjection to foreign conquest through the growth of an individualism and personal independence that makes cooperation impossible. I think that nicely summarizes what the tensions are there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's, uh, look, you know, the United States um, has long been, but especially today, uh, incredibly uh, diverse uh, in terms of race, ethnicity, religion, uh, uh, in, in all sorts of ways. And it's, of course, geographically a massive uh, a country. And, um, and that diversity uh, creates, of course, and, and because also in part, uh, the country had slavery for many decades and was founded uh, on, in part, at least on, on slavery. Um, you know, it was sort of woven into the, to the fabric of uh, our institutions in the country, and in particular, of course, in the slaveholding South. Um, and so, you know, the question, I think one big question for the system is whether uh, it can have a sort of political stability where there can be reasoned debates grounded in, in facts and argument and, you know, kind of uh, civic discourse, right, and civic stability versus the times in our history, and, and frankly, even January 6th, when it has become uh, uh, more violent, uh, the, the means have, you know, Gephardt actually used to say that politics um, is violence through other means, right? Or it's a way of channeling what a lot of societies uh, settle through uh, a physical conflict. And, um, you know, politics, that is one purpose of it, but it doesn't, of course, always serve that purpose uh, in the way that it should. And and then also this question of representation, right? People in this country, in this vast country of 300 plus million people, as diverse as it is, um, need to feel represented. And the thing that, one thing that concerns me, of course, is that, you know, in over the last five, six decades in particular, a lot of uh, people have uh, lost, I think, a lot of faith in institutions, whether it's the media or uh, Congress or political institutions, um, uh, universities, right? And so there's a, a, a kind of, you know, like not just a skepticism, but a cynicism. And I think that that, you know, that can be, of course, corrosive. Um, and at the same time that we have seen a lot of participation of uh, people who are uh, care deeply about issues and about the country, and um, and who are you know out there either protesting, voting, and doing the things that we would expect in a in a robust democracy. 
Mm. Yeah, when you think of somebody like a, a, a Ed, Edmund Burke and Berkey and conservatism, you know, it's not, you know, the respect for tradition and institutions that have worked pretty well. Let's not just tear the whole system down like they did in France, because look what happened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's do it legally and slowly, uh, constitutionally and so on. That's what I think of as I, when I think of kind of mainstream or centrist conservatism. Mm -hmm. The Birchers, and then by extension, a lot of the people we mentioned that are active today on the far right, they're not really conservatives in a Burkean sense. There's something else. But because we have a duopoly, you just you have to be on one team or the other. You're not going to get elected, right? So you kind of have to become the GOP, and that's that. That's the problem we have there. You know, it's interesting. The Berkshires uh, flirted, often flirted with third party politics, because especially in the nineteen the society was formed in 1958. But in the 1950s, the founders, um, certainly Robert Welch, but other uh, members of the founders looked at the Republican Party, which was probably their natural home, small government, and they saw Dwight Eisenhower and other leaders in the Republican Party essentially as traitors, right? They had betrayed Joe McCarthy, Robert Taft, two of, of their heroes, um, and that really there was no real home for them. At least some of them felt that at times. Um, and you see the some of the Birch leadership debating uh, debating this question. So there was one Birch founder who was urging Robert Welch to support Richard Nixon for president, the Republican nominee in 1960. And Welch and most of, I think, other uh, Birch leaders uh, said, no, you know, we can't support him. He's, um, he's, he's not, you know, he's not like a true anti-communist. Um, he doesn't see the conspiracy as it exists in the United States from their vantage point. Um, so they did work within the Republican Party at times, but for example, in 1972, uh, two Birch uh, leaders, John Schmitz, uh, a former member of Congress, and uh, Tom Anderson ran as the American Party presidential candidates, ran as a third party uh, challenge. And so you see them kind of toggle back and forth. Um, and uh, But ultimately, ultimately, you know, Birchers, a lot of their successors, they recognize that really to succeed in American politics, as you said, Michael, You've got to be with one of the two teams, right? You've got to be with, and in this case, the Republican Party. Um, and because we don't live in a multi-party democracy. Uh, and so I think that dynamic, of course, has consequences. Uh, and, and as I try to argue in the book, um, a lot of Republican, more mainstream Republicans felt the need, especially at campaign time, um, not necessarily governing, but a campaign time to appeal to some of the more fringe elements in the base to, to win their support, um, even if they frustrated the fringe when it came to governance. But, but that's just astonishing that they could accuse Nixon of not being anti-communist enough or not getting it. I mean, he's famous. That's how he got famous. That was his whole thing. Well, yeah. Right? Well, he was yeah. rooting out communists. Well, and, and, yeah. Well, look, uh, sorry, so John Schmitz, who, who I mentioned earlier, uh, a member of Congress from Southern California, uh, a leader of the Birch Society, um, he went to Congress and he very quickly uh, grew very disillusioned with Nixon. He was never a big Nixon fan to begin with. But when Nixon went to China, right, uh, uh, pursuing a period of pursuing detente uh, and, and the open door to China, uh, Schmitz quipped that uh, I don't mind Nixon going to China. Uh, I just don't want him to come back. And, you know, the White House was was uh, uh, pissed at that, right? right. Um, but it does give you a sense because you know, they saw Nixon as um, basically uh, allowing the communists to win the war in Vietnam. Uh, they saw him as opening up to uh, uh, align with communists in China uh, and, and elsewhere. Um, and, uh, and that he was, uh, in a sense, part of this, um, I don't know if they would use the word establishment, but he was, uh, really part mm. of the central problem in American life. And also that he had done things domestically to grow the size of government and to allow these, what the Bircher mm -hmm. said were, or their successors said were communistic ideas, uh, into, um, 
into Washington and, and to exert control over people's lives. And so um, the Birchers, as far as I can tell, almost always hated Richard Nixon uh, and and viewed him as but, but that's uh, a that's the later Nixon, right? It, just yeah. refresh yeah. our memories on the Alger Hiss case. Isn't, isn't that well, how Nixon first came to public light? Yeah, well, Nixon was a very hardline anti-communist when he ran uh, for Congress uh, from uh, California and then ran, of course, against uh, Helen uh, 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 Douglas, a gay hand Douglas. And um, and he famously called her the pink lady, uh, tarring her as, uh, uh, you know, as as basically a communist uh, and um, and then tangled once he was in the Senate, tangled with uh, Alger Hiss and you know, charged him with uh, being a spy. And uh, Nixon did become um, a hero for, you know, a number of hardline anti-communists and was seen that way. At the same time, though, uh, remember, he was Dwight Eisenhower's vice president. And he was seen as someone not just by Birchers, but people like William Buckley, for example, or, you know, um, other people who were you know, further, um, not to the left, but just less Birchian, uh, so to speak, uh, Nixon was not really trusted. Um, he was seen as something of a sellout. And because if he was willing to mm. uh, side with Dwight Eisenhower and defend Eisenhower, well, I think um, Goldwater called it a dime store New Deal, Eisenhower's presidency. And and Nixon was tied up with that as well. And so, um you know, he was not seen, despite his anti-communist bona fides, he was not seen as sufficiently hard line, especially, I think, after he became associated with uh, with Eisenhower, who, especially the Birchers, uh, tended to, to despise. Yeah, interesting. There's, but what I'm after here is there's something else that goes on here, I think, in which you get these kind of infighting within groups of who's really the purest X, whatever that is. Uh, I saw this with the kind of whole Ayn Rand, Milton Friedman, Austrian economics, where they would like fight amongst themselves about, you know, who is the true libertarian or the true objectivist. And, you know, if you didn't, if you weren't all the way over with them, then you were a communist or a socialist. And it's like Milton Friedman was a communist. What? <laughs> you know, we yeah. saw this, we've seen this with the atheist movement, you know, mm -hmm. you're not a true atheist or, or the you know a feminist groups have splintered. You're not a real feminist. You know, it's the no true Scotsman thing, right? We end up kind of slicing ever smaller portions of your group, uh, and, and it seems like some of that's what's going on here. I mean, how could you yeah. go after Eisenhower? This guy's a war hero. He's he's just you know everybody loved Eisenhower, yeah. right? Well, well you apparently make, not. Well, yeah, well, you make a an interesting point. I mean, there is a way. I think part of it may be a sectarian warfare. Right where your your supposed allies are also not pure enough, and um, and I think it's an inherent tension in the political system because um, for purists who are supporting politicians, often politicians have to make compromises or deals of some kind in order to win election, in order to pass elements of their agenda, uh, and. And really skilled politicians can build a coalition, can kind of keep that coalition more or less intact. But um, for, you know, the more idealistic or ideological members or supporters, those compromises may uh, feel like sellouts. I mean, it feels like they're being sold out and betrayed. And to get your question about Eisenhower, um, there was a real sense of betrayal. And... Uh, Robert Welch, who founded the Birch Society, when uh, Eisenhower defeated Bob Taft for the Republican nomination in 1952, Welch called it the uh, essentially the dirtiest deal in American political history, and there was a sense that a true, um, a true conservative, a true someone who was really going to uh, uh, oppose the New Deal and was going to roll back the New Deal and um, and roll back the progressive era movement uh, and not engage in these kind of compromises with communistic ideas as they saw it, um, uh, was defeated through, you know, machinations. 
And so, uh, uh, you know, someone like Eisenhower, you know, Welch, I mean, the most infamous quote that he had, uh, which was in part why the Bursars were so controversial, was it, as he wrote in his book, The Politician, uh, that Eisenhower was a dedicated agent of the communist conspiracy. And so um, it gives you a sense of uh, how they viewed Eisenhower really as as the enemy and as a great betrayer of Americanist ideals and principles. Astonishing. Wow. Okay, just give us a quick, who was John Birch and how did the society get founded? And a little bit about Robert Welch. Yeah, so uh, John Birch was uh, an evangelist a turned uh, army intelligence officer who uh, was with the U.S. Army in China during World War II. I believe he was at one point attached to the Flying Tigers. Uh, there's actually uh, uh, an entire biography written about John Birch uh, uh, by a, a, a guy named Terry Lotz uh, that came out with Oxford University Press almost a decade ago. Um, but anyway, Birch is relevant in the sense that he was killed by Mao's communist forces 10 days after the end of World War II. And um, Robert Welch uh, uh, learned of this, this murder as he saw it. He uh, did uh, some research uh, in part working with Bill Nolan, the former senator from California, uh, who was sympathetic and um, and uh, and then Welch himself wrote a book on the life of John Birch, portraying Birch as really the first victim in World War Three, right? The first victim of communist aggression, but really more importantly, as a a victim uh, as part of a, a conspiracy to cover up his death, a conspiracy by U.S. government forces essentially to hide. Birch's murder from uh, uh, from the American public, and uh, because you know they were there were communists within the government. I mean that was the the idea at least. Um, and Welch, for his part, was uh, a candy uh, manufacturer. Um, uh, he was a salesman. Uh, he uh, was uh, he did well. Um, he made money. He was quite successful. He was a member, like a lot of Birch founders, of the National Association of Manufacturers. He was on the board. And um, he became a kind of anti-communist proselytizer in the 1950s. Um, but unlike Reagan, who had the speech in the 1950s, um, you know, Welch was, uh, you know, more, uh, far more, he was more conspiratorial. He was, uh, I think, a lot less genial uh, compared to Reagan. Um, but he um, he impressed a lot of his fellow businessmen in the, in the National Association of Manufacturers. And in the late 1950s, he decided to retire from business and go full time into anti-communist work and activism. And uh, he set up a magazine and make a long story short, he invited, I think it was 17 of his friends, 11 of them showed up to a secret, very hush-hush meeting in Indianapolis in December 1958. And over two days, he laid out the communist inroads around the world, within the United States, the communist conspiracy, and uh, agreed with them to establish the John Birch Society as a kind of shock educational force, right? That they were going to recruit members, um, uh, uh, bring in more very well-to-do business uh, leaders and also just regular Americans. And they were going to educate the public about the communist inroads and the communist conspiracy inside the United States in order to change the direction of the country. It's so interesting because in 19, let's see, what was it? 1979, 1980, one of my cycling friends talked me into taking this seminar from a guy named Andrew Galambos, who we would call an anarcho-capitalist, but he he wouldn't have called himself that. But in any case, it was you know how we can all 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 just have nothing but private property contracts for everything, mm -hmm. and uh, and it was and they met in these hotel rooms, these little tiny hotel conference rooms, and I didn't even meet him. I just listened to a tape about it. But there was this kind of sense like, oh my God, we're on this this cutting edge. This is going to be huge. We're going to. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, you know, there's like 17 of us in this room. How are we going to do anything? Mm. You know, but 
you know, that that is how those groups often start. You know, so I, I, I love that whole scenario you portrayed. Well, and, and what's interesting about your story is that that was really how, in part at least, the Birch Society recruited people. Um, so the first meeting, most of them, they kind of knew each other or knew of each other. But as they started to reach out, they would often have pretty small recruitment meetings. And Welch or maybe someone else would do an intensive seminar. Sometimes they would have tapes or record or recordings. And, um, and it was a kind of uh, hand-to-hand combat in the sense that they were trying to you know, recruit a few people here, here, a couple people there. They had a chapter-based membership dues-paying model. So members would pay dues. They would belong to a chapter in a local community. Chapters were capped at 20 people. If you reach that cap, you, someone had to start a new chapter. Um, chapters were not supposed to coordinate with one another. Um, but the success, one of the, the insights that, that the Birchers had was that um, they could recruit people who wanted to act against communism within their communities, right? They wanted to filter a almost a single-minded conspiratorial brand of anti-communism through the perceived needs of their local communities and people felt like a lot of Americans, um, or at least thousands of Americans, felt like the Birch Society is offering us a chance to take action against this threat in a way that other anti-communist movements and magazines didn't. That they were all talk, the Birch Society is about the action. And that's in part what appealed to, to a lot of Americans about it. <laughs> so Welch was sort of the Apostle Paul to Jesus. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So on these, um, so let's go through some of their positions on this tension between liberalism and conservatism or, you know, progress and change versus institutions and stability. So race, immigration, foreign policy, American isolationism, war, abortion, religion, you know, they, so they're kind of all clustered around that far right end. I've always found it interesting that if I know your position on gun control or abortion, or whatever, I can predict where you're going to fall on most other issues. That always bothers me because I don't even know you. I shouldn't even know what you think, but I do once I know one thing. So there is some sort of social psychological thing going on there that's underlying these issues. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, so the Birchers, um, and and I think this is another strength. You you know you mentioned a number of issues and. This was another insight that they had, which is that um, by arguing that there was a conspiracy within, that the communists were making all these inroads in American life, the Birch Society could, in a sense, mean different things to different people. And so for some people, it meant, and this was reflected in some of their their, uh, front groups, they put up front groups, some of their slogans. So for some people... Um, They were drawn to it because they wanted, as the slogan had it, to get the U.S. out of the United Nations, right? They repudiated the post-World War II international order and the the kind of liberal internationalist uh, uh, consensus of sorts that uh, both parties, for the most part, had uh, 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 agreed to in uh, mid-20th century. Um, On uh, issues of... Uh, race, for example. I mean, this is a more complicated discussion, but for the civil rights movement, you know, it was no accident the Birch Society really came into its own during the, as the civil rights movement was gaining momentum. Um, they had a, a, a campaign, a famous campaign, Impeach Earl Warren, what was in part a reflection of uh, the uh, fury at the Brown versus Board of Education integration decision. Um, but the, the Birch Society argued that the civil rights movement was a communist, uh, it was controlled by the Kremlin, right? So it was not a genuine movement as part of a a history of the struggle for African-American rights and human equality. Um, It was not organic to the United States. It was a Kremlin-directed plot. And and so you can see how they're arguing that these foreign actors and ideas are infiltrating the United States to... um, to really cause chaos uh, in the country. Um, And, you know, you can kind of go down the list, but uh, there certainly was a morality, a kind of uh, a Christian fundamentalist uh, morality, sort of prefiguring some of the religious right uh, on uh, issues of sex education, 
a lot of activity around uh, textbooks and school boards and what are the local libraries uh, uh, offering, right? Are they offering Americanist texts or, or, uh, or, or socialistic texts? Um, and, uh, and, you know, and, and there were uh, other issues as well, but it gives you a sense of the, um, the medley of beliefs that, that a lot of uh, Birchers held. So rem remind me, Earl Warren was appointed by Eisenhower, right? Yes. And he was considered to be conservative, but he kind of flipped and became much more supportive of liberal causes. And wasn't there some angst about that? Just in yeah. general, not just among the Birchers. Yes. Well, yeah. Well, Earl Warren uh, was governor of California, a Republican, um, but generally seen as a you know more moderate Republican, as many Republicans in California were. It's not all, but a lot. Um, he was actually during World War II uh, very um, very much in favor of the Japanese American internment camps, and uh, was an important part of that. Uh, but once he uh, got on the bench, and you know, many ways it probably shouldn't be that surprising, given that there were some. You know, obviously, there were a number of Republicans in the 1940s and 50s who um, subscribed to civil rights and were were uh, more liberal, what we consider liberal today, on social policy. Um, but Warren, the Warren Court, issued a series of decisions. Um, the most famous, of course, was the landmark Brown uh, decision, uh, ordering uh, uh, declaring segregation unconstitutional in in the schools. Uh, but a number of other issues that the Birchers found, uh, decisions that, that repelled the Birchers, and it was not just the Birchers, of course, it was, um, you know, a lot of Southern Democrats, right, who um, believed that the federal government had no business interfering in what they called states' rights. Uh, but um, so Warren, uh, the Warren Court on prayer in schools, for example, uh, uh, prohibiting it, um, uh, giving uh, so-called rights to defendants and, and alleged criminals. Uh, they thought that, you know, that was a real blow to the police and to law and order. Uh, and, um, and so there were a range of issues that, that the Birchers, but again, it was not just the Birchers, although they kind of crystallized this in their impeach Earl Warren campaign, where they put up these big billboards all over the country saying impeach Earl Warren, you know, save America. Um, they crystallized the the anger at uh, what they said, what they called unelected judges who were um, twisting and distorting and really destroying the subverting the Constitution in order to impose a communistic or some said maybe liberal um, ideological agenda on and trampling on people's rights and on the states rights of the states. And that was sort of their their argument. So, you know, Warren was um, both beloved, but uh, also obviously uh, hated very much. And actually I have a section in the book where I describe, um, you know, some of the security protections around him um, because, uh, you know, with various police details um, who were uh, following him around and sort of fears for his safety uh, that some law enforcement authorities had. Um, because of uh, so much, uh, you know, anger and uh, animus toward him. Hmm, interesting. By the way, I'm recording this in Santa Barbara. I'm about three blocks away from the Earl Warren Fairgrounds. <laughs> so apparently he's a hero here in Santa, liberal, liberal Santa Barbara. <laughs> well, Earl Warren, you know, he's a, he's a Californian. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, look, he's a significant right. figure in 20th century American life. You know, a lot of people, I think, today yeah. probably would know his name. So let's just let me see if I can articulate the kind of general worldview. America is a white Christian nation. You still hear this, right? We're founded in Judeo-Christian values, mostly white. Yeah, slavery was an unfortunate thing, but you know, uh, we want to keep the races apart, segregated, and because the mixing of the races is kind of a 1950s reflection, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mixing the races could contaminate the purity of these values that we hold. Now, no one would make that argument today, but they would say something like foreigners from other countries like Mexico or Central America are going to bring with them ideas that are not American ideas and values. 
And we like immigrants that you know want to sign the guest book and 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 sign on to American values, okay, but a lot of them are not, right? And you hear this in Europe, uh, like when Germany uh, opened up the borders to all these you know Muslim immigrants from uh, Syria and so forth, like oh they're not bringing Western European values, they're bringing other values. So that that's kind of the argument. Set it aside whether they're racist or not. Pretty much everybody in the 1950s were racist by today's standards. But they're actually making some kind of a internally coherent argument for all of these things. America has no purpose in getting entangled in European wars and conflicts, or we shouldn't be the world's policemen. We should just take care of ourselves. You know, let those, as, as Trump would call them, you know, these shithole countries just rot. What, it's none of our business. Not my problem, right? We have our own problems. We should take care of them here and so on. So I'm trying to articulate how these things kind of tie together. Mm -hmm. Abortion, yeah. well, you know, these Christian people, if they were just good Christian women who took vows of chastity and so they wouldn't get pregnant, right? And so it's really a moral values issue, not a you know, unwanted pregnancy yeah. issue or whatever, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I would say the, the way that to the Birchers, a lot of these issues were tied together was through this idea that the communists for many decades including especially with the New Deal in the 1930s, but even beyond, for at least three decades, some would say four or five, um, had been um, taking power, more and more power inside the United States, taking over major institutions and parroting the communist line and imposing communist ideas on the country. And that tied together the the moral issue, right? The issues around uh, a morality or a teachings in schools um, or liberalization of the culture. It tied together um, uh, explanations of why the United States was not uh, winning the Cold War, right? How did you know China uh, uh, go communist? Um, what happened at Yalta, right? You know, FDR gave away so much to to Stalin. It was part of this, you know backroom deal that he had, or he was sympathetic uh, uh, to communists. So I, I'm trying to give you a sense of how the, the, the idea of communism, this sort of catch-all, it's sort of a rubric, it can uh, play in many different forms, right, in American politics and, and international affairs. And, you know, the Birchers on, on the issue of race, it, it was interesting. So, um, you know, the Birchers would say, that, look, we're not opposed to integration. I mean, it was more the KKK, I think, that explicitly said, we don't want the mixing of the races. Birchers would say often, uh, we're not really opposed to integration, but um, but we do think that it is communistic to impose integration, um, especially from without, right, from outside of the state or outside of the town, um, and uh, and that it was part of this conspiracy. So, now, you know, is that a, a, a racist argument or not? I mean, in some ways, it does hark back to um, the, the birtherism claim about Barack Obama, right? This idea that, you know, ultimately, this African-American man, is he wasn't born here, and thus he's, inel he's foreign, right? He's ineligible to be president. You know, of course, no African-American could aspire to power, you know, or it's not like a truly American uh, uh, phenomenon. And so I think that you know, there's some overlap between like birtherism and the and the communist charge against uh, civil rights. But but again, I would say it's that communist sort of idea and conspiracy that wove a lot of these different domestic and foreign uh, uh, policy and political discussions together. A, a last point I should make, too, which is that, as I argue in the book, you know, the Birchers helped to forge this anti-elite, apocalyptic and a really a more violent mode of politics. A lot of the rhetoric was really quite uh, violent. In 1974, the uh, society's uh, leading African American uh, a spokesperson gave. Uh, he went to a rally uh, in Denver, and he said that uh, he accused the nation's political leaders of imposing planned shortages of consumer goods on the country. And he said, uh, "Well, we're going to take." Uh, Nixon and Kissinger and Fulbright and politicians of that sort, and we're going to try them for treason, and they'll be hanged. And and then he said, he added, you know, to the newsmen out there, 
take that message and publicize it. The message they'll get is the Americans are coming. And, you know, that gives you another sense of this, you know, taking the country back, if not through the ballot box, well, through force. We're going to hang them. Um, and, and that was an element in the rhetoric as well, part of the style. There really is a conspiracy theory about somebody behind the scenes pulling the strings to make things happen. It's not that the other side, in some kind of John Stuart Mill esque way, thinks differently from me. They have their ideas, I have my ideas, and we think our ideas are better, but they're not horrible people. No, it's that they want to ruin our country. They're actually up to no good trying to do these things. You still hear that rhetoric today. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, so that is a, an interesting distinction that you made. Um, Welch, Robert Welch, at one point, he said to, um, this is actually a, a, an operative who had infiltrated Birch Society headquarters, um, but the operative reported that Welch said, look, we don't hate anybody. We just hate what they stand for. Problem, though, is that when you accuse uh, Martin Luther King of being a communist, right, and put up a billboard saying, here's Martin Luther King at communist training school. He wasn't a communist, right? It was actually a school of labor organizing and civil rights organizing. Um, when you accuse Eisenhower of being communist, you are, as you say, Michael, you are saying that those people really are, are enemies, right? They're enemies of the Constitution. They're traitors uh, to the country. You know, again, as this, this leader, this Birch Society leader said in 1954, um, you know, these people are committing treason. And, and the conspiracy element of it is also, of course, uh, a, a central piece of it because um, the conspiracy, of course, is un-American, right? It's fundamentally at odds with the creed and the, the, the rules and arrangements that the country it basically is turning the United States into Soviet Russia, right? Or we're five years away from becoming actually just a puppet state of Soviet Russia. We're really close. And that kind of accusation, that kind of rhetoric takes away any sort of space, I think, for debate about, well, here's my interpretation of the Constitution. Here's my idea about the role of central government, right? Some of the ideas that really hark back to the founding of the Republic, um, it, it, it doesn't leave any room. And and that is, it's very hard in a sense to have a, a, you know, a reasoned debate about, you know, let's say policy or legislative outcomes. Yeah, it reminds me of that scene you talk about in the book when uh, Obama and McCain were campaigning against each other. And there was that famous moment uh, in which a, a woman gets up on stage with the microphone and says, you know, I think Obama uh, is a Muslim. And then McCain grabs the mic from her and says, no, ma'am, he's not a Muslim. Yeah. You know, he just is yeah. an American with different ideas yeah. than me. You know, he now that's that's what I think of as centrist conservatism, yeah. or moderate well, yeah. conservatism. Well, well and what's interesting is that, of course, and, and McCain did that. It really is a, a a famous moment in light of especially where we are now and where, you know, the Republican Party is now. Um, you know, one can never imagine Trump doing uh, something like that. He would probably do the opposite. Um, but of course, with McCain, you know, at the same time, his vice presidential nominee, Sarah Palin, was going around the country and saying, you know, I'm happy to be in the real America to, you know, all white crowds and basically, you know, saying, look, Obama's not really like, you know, again, it's sort of questions about people's patriotism or or their identity. Right. Are they really American? Excuse me. That's why the the I think the the birtherism claim um, was. You know, it was a conspiracy theory, right, that Obama had hid his birth certificate and or, or he faked it. Um, and we have this unconstitutional um, ill, you know, he, he was never eligible. He was ineligible to be president, this form presence inside the Oval Office. And uh, that does hark back, I think, to some of these other far right conspiracy theories, and there are of course conspiracy theories on the far left, but I think it it does you know elements of race, uh, un Americanism, a lack of patriotism, and um, and you know similar again you know he's Muslim, he's communist, it, it's it it's that kind of uh, message. 
Yeah, a little bit like how Trump said about Q when he's asked about QAnon. Well, I don't know much about them, but they're they love me and they love our country. So what's wrong yeah. with that? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Whereas well, McCain, yeah. when he when he grabbed the mic and said, no, ma'am. Yeah. Maybe he lost some support there in that crowd anyway. Yeah. I mean, my sense was that he knew McCain knew he was going to lose at that point. And it was pretty late in the campaign. And uh, I believe he had already picked Palin, which was sort of a, a bit of a Hail Mary. I think, you know, he knew that, that the structure yeah. of the election was against him. And I think he knew he was going down. Uh, and and that's not to. You know, he what he still did was impressive uh, in that moment. But yeah, I'm sure he did. I'm sure you're right that he lost some uh, support. And, you know, McCain, in a way, is uh, along with Jeb Bush and George W. Bush are great foils for Donald Trump. Right They're They're really ideal foils in part because of what you described as sort of how they handle these these different moments in a sense. Right. Trump says, you know, QAnon people. Yeah, you know, I I don't know much about them, but they love their country. They're great patriots. Um, you know, they're real Americans. Um, and uh, whereas, uh, you know, McCain at least in some moments said that, you know, no, he's he's not Muslim. You know, he's just he's a good American. I just have real difference uh, of opinion with him. Uh, but but my larger point is that it, uh, all these politicians at some point have to decide if they're going to alienate some of the people on the far left or right, because we need those votes. It's a, it's a duopoly, <laughs> only two teams. So, uh, and, and we don't want them throwing their vote away or not voting at all. So talk about, well, let's see, let's go through how Nixon, Reagan, and Bush dealt with the Birchers. They don't want to alienate them, right? We want those votes, but you don't want to cozy up too close to them because that could, uh, you know, draw a lot of negative uh, publicity. How, how did that unfold? Well, uh, Nixon in 1962, when he ran for governor of California, uh, uh, famously denounced the Birch Society, which was very strong in California in 62. And uh, he lost a lot of support. Um, and in fact, he, uh, his opponent in the primary, a guy named Joe Schell, uh, won, I think, about a third of the vote, which, you know, Nixon had been vice president. So that was a big blow. And uh, I think Nixon later on realized, as did Reagan and uh, many others, that, you know, going as far as Nixon did is not the way to build the coalition, right? That you need um, the, the money, the energy, and the votes of uh, the fringe, whatever it is at the time, Bircher's in 62 in California, but, you know, it sort of morphs through the decades. Um, and you know, what I try to do in the last part of the book is to um, identify some moments when, you know, more mainstream conservative Republican leaders, whether it's Reagan or George H.W. Bush or Nixon, you know, that they or George W. Bush, they um, they try to appeal, especially in their campaigns, to elements of of the far right. So, say, giving a speech at Bob Jones University. Right, which banned interracial dating, uh, or Reagan uh, infamously uh, uh, going to Neshoba County, Mississippi, and kicking off his general election campaign uh, uh, in 1980 by saying uh, uh, states' rights, right, invoking the the mantra of massive resistance to civil rights, the same place where three civil rights workers were murdered. Um, but I also try to pay attention to how they governed. And again, it's, you know, I sketch this out. It's, you know, it's just the last third of the book, but I try to pay attention to how they govern and argue that on a lot of the big issues, a lot of the central issues of the time, um, inter internationalism versus anti-interventionism, um, uh, conspiracy theories, uh, immigration and immigration reform, uh, uh, even civil rights. I mean, none of those Republican leaders I, I mentioned were you know, hugely supportive of civil rights, but a lot of times they did bend and they signed, for example, renewals of the Voting Rights Act into law in ways that, you know, people in the fringe were not, you know, people like Ron Paul were not supportive of. Um, and and they agreed at times to expand the welfare state, even, you know, as they cut taxes. So um, there are ways in which their governance on pretty central issues frustrated uh, people on, and I should also add, that they never really through those decades 
got a whole lot done on the social, moral, religious right issues. I mean, they never banned abortion. I mean, up until the Supreme Court recently, um, a prayer in school, right? They didn't, they didn't get that overturned. A flag burning, right? They didn't pass a constitutional amendment. Um, there were a lot of issues in which they would say, I, you know, I support X and Y and Z on the campaign trail, but then they couldn't, for various reasons, get it done uh, once they were in office. And so there were, you know, I argue tensions within the movement. Um, and there were times when they overlapped as well, ideologically and on policy matters. Uh, but these tensions, I think, were also central to uh, the kind of conservative Republican coalition and in part was a dividing line between these mainstream conservatives and electorally successful figures and the more far right activist types. So if you can deliver enough votes for a candidate, even if they don't agree with your positions and you're not winning anything, you're a bircher, but they have to adopt some of those, at least in name. And that's a kind of victory for their movement. It is uh, certainly, uh, you know, getting, um, for example, you can have a victory by getting it written into the party platform. Right. And in 1980, I think the Republican Party platform uh, came out against the Equal Rights Amendment for the first time and against abortion, uh, I believe, for the first time. And so those are kinds of victories. Um, what political leaders say on the campaign trail matters because it is putting down a marker that you are for or against a particular issue. Now, it doesn't always translate, of course, into policy and governance, but it certainly can become a kind of victory of sorts. And, um, and it has consequences, right? It has consequences for the kind of people you have to appoint once you're in office, the kind of policies that you have to pursue. But the problem that a lot of Republican presidents in particular, and also people who aspire to the presidency had, is that they, the, those, a lot of those positions, for example, a ban on abortion, were not really popular with a majority of the country um, or the conspiracy theories, uh, for example. Um, you know, were not really, I mean, they had some support, but they were not really central, part of the central part of their appeal. And so Republicans often had to straddle these lines in building their coalition. And remember, there are a lot of different kinds of conservatives, right? As I lay out in the introduction of the book, there are Chamber of Commerce conservatives, Wall Street conservatives, fundamentalist uh, Christians, um, libertarians. Uh, you know, you can, uh, uh, there are, you know, very strong kind of internationalists, right? Um, you know, uh, national security hawks, neocons, right? You can kind of go down the list. And so keeping that coalition together uh, is very tricky. And, um, and what, I, what I ultimately argue is that, you know, having the far right in the coalition uh, uh, and eventually around 2008, 2010, the far right really starts to gain more and more power and cannibalizes the Republican Party over time. And, and mm, the mainstream still exists in the Republican Party, people like Mitch mm -hmm. McConnell. But, you know, I would argue that, you know, MAGA is on top and, and that those ideas have been swirling on the far right for at least a generation or two. Yeah, for sure. Let's talk about the Birchers and, and the moral majority and Jerry Falwell and all that. So harken back to the early 80s. You know, this is kind of when I started coming of age as a, as a writer uh, and I was writing about evolution and creationism. And I just could not figure out what, what is the obsession with the theory of evolution? These people, they probably don't even really understand what the theory is. And then it wasn't long before I realized this has nothing to do with the theory of evolution. This has to do with, you know, if you accept Darwin, then you're going to be an atheist. And if you're an atheist, you have no moral standards. And then America is going to go to hell in a handbasket. So, it, you know, it comes down to politics. It's like, oh, that's what that's about. Okay. <laughs> right. So, um, you know, I think a lot of that is touches on some of these themes. I always wondered, you know, was there some sort of a backdoor deal with Reagan who never struck me as particularly religious, where somebody like Falwell says, look, if you come out against abortion and this and that, you know, I can get you 10 million votes or something like that. Well, I don't know if it was a backroom deal. I think it was a pretty open, you know, open arrangement. <laughs> right. uh, you know, Reagan, um, you know, remember Reagan as governor uh, signed a law, signed into law, a bill that liberalized abortion. 
And, you know, abortion was not originally, and, you know, my first book, which was focused on Reagan's first campaign for governor of California in 1966, yeah, that was before abortion was a major issue. But, you know, this is not, abortion was not an issue that kind of animated Reagan <laughs> early on. And frankly, the, the issues that would become known as the moral majority of the religious right, those issues were not really central to Reagan early on uh, in his political career. But, you know, Reagan was a very savvy politician. He understood uh, uh, that there was obviously a lot of energy uh, in these areas. Um, I don't know how much that those culture war issues really animated Reagan. I mean, I think there were other issues that animated him more, like communism and and the the, the struggle, the Cold War struggle. Um, but he certainly, in 1979, 1980, uh, uh, made major efforts and very successful efforts to capitalize on this very powerful uh, grassroots uh, evangelical movement. And I believe it was 1978, the midterm elections, where a number of evangelical conservatives realized that abortion, only if 78 was five years after the Roe v. Wade decision, abortion could be a powerful issue, a motivating issue, can mobilize supporters. And Reagan, of course, understood that as well. Uh, and, um, and, you know, and he uh, appeared at, you know, Jerry Falwell's, I think, university, uh, uh, you know, all, you know, sort of you had, you almost had to, if you're going to win the nomination. Uh, and, uh, and that was an important part of his coalition. Just like Trump speaking at Liberty University with Jerry Falwell Jr. supporting him. Absolutely. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I get that. On the abortion issue, you know, again, what's behind that? You know, why did it become important to conservatives? Just thinking out loud here for a second. And here, here I'll channel George Carlin on this, you know, that that pro-lifers are pro-life all the way up to the yes. birth of the child. And after that, you're on your yes. own. That's uh, Yes, <laughs> you know, George Carlin you know. is brilliant about a lot of things. And that, that's one of them. Yeah. Yes. You know, no yeah. no aid for dependent yeah. families, no yeah. school yes. uh, vouchers and lunches, no yeah, food well. stamps, you know, and, and so on. Until... You get they get to military age. <laughs> then we're interested yes, in you again. Yes, yes, right? you've seen that bit. But I've seen that bit too. It's a brilliant bit. <laughs> yeah, but it's funny because there's some truth to that, right? Sure. Uh, and so, what is it that they're really after there? I I, mm. I don't know. It's hard to say. Uh, you know, it's religion or what? I don't know. Well, uh, well, uh, look, I'm. Uh, it's hard for me to speak to you know what is, and I think you know, people are probably motivated, people who are anti-abortion, right, who want to make abortion illegal or mostly illegal, probably have, have different motivations, right? Um, uh, some, uh, you know, I think some genuinely believe that conception, uh, after conception, there's a life, you know, someone is a, a and that, right, right. you know, and that it's murder. Um, others, I think, probably see abortion as a catch-all for the degeneration really of, of, of the culture and morality in society, right? It's an issue that says a lot about a lot of other issues, for example. Um, you know, it's not just about abortion. Uh, and it's also about morality and sex education. It's about increase in secularism. Um, I think it's per, in part about a declining, uh, maybe a population of Christian, you know, white Christian America. I think that's probably an element in it as well. So, um, you know, it's probably a lot of things to a lot of people. Uh, but, um, but to your Carlin quote, uh, you know, talking about contemporary politics, clearly, I think one of the reasons some Republicans, a lot of Republicans have had trouble politically is because with the Dobbs decision, the overturning of Roe v. Wade, and then the very aggressive moves on the part of all these states to impose virtual bans on any kind of abortion. And and we now have a lot of stories of women uh, whose lives have been put in jeopardy um, and, and have had very serious health complications as a result of these policies. I think a lot of Americans uh, view this as, uh, even some who may vote Republican otherwise, they view this as a no-go. And um, you know, you saw that, I mean, the 10-point victory in Wisconsin for the liberal Supreme Court uh, justice just 
the other day in Wisconsin, which is so such a close battleground state, um, I think is surprising. And you know, a lot of commentators said abortion was really central to that, and I, I think I think that's right. We're seeing a kind of backlash to to Dobbs, and and the majority of the country is not. I don't think where Dobbs is. They're not opposed to, um, you know, they're not, they don't want to ban Roe v. Wade and ban abortions. Yeah, I I agree. Well, I conceive of it. The, pro- the problem isn't abortions. The problem is unwanted pregnancy. Okay, why are women getting pregnant when they don't want to? And then you have, get into economics and education and, and so forth. But I know that pro-lifers believe that life begins at conception. Okay, let's just grant that that's what they really believe and that's their argument. And therefore, murder, it's murder, and there and murder is wrong. We have to do whatever we can to lower those numbers. Okay, how about murders by guns? You know, should we control guns? Well, no, no. Freedom trumps this. This is the price we pay. These school shootings, this is the price we pay for the freedoms we want. Well, why can't we pay the price of giving women reproductive rights and their freedoms? And the price we pay is some of them are going to abort their fetuses. You know, in, yeah. in other words, I'm looking for consistency of a principle that should underlie these yeah. things. Well, uh, I mean, uh, principle and consistency are uh, are pretty elusive, right? And as for the reasons <laughs> you you laid out, uh, yeah, I mean, um, well, if you value human life, right? Um, you know, one would think you would want to protect the children at these schools who are being gunned down. I mean, they've been being people. Children have been they've been getting gunned down since Columbine and uh, for decades now. And, you know, Sandy Hook is now what, almost a decade ago oh, or a decade ago. I mean, um, so, more than. Uh, you know, there is, um, but <laughs> look, I think that uh, a kind of, if, if we're talking about the, you know, what was the moral majority or, you know, the, the Christian right, um, I think that there is an alliance around a certain set of issues that um, defines, again, freedom in a very, um, in a way that uh, I would not define it personally, but but a lot of other Americans wouldn't define it in that way either, right? Because for a lot of Americans, freedom is defined as the right to um, have health care. And healthcare in a way that is safe for you, you know, as a as a pregnant woman, as a potential mother, right? Safe for your baby. I mean, the freedom, right, to make your own choices about reproduction, um, the freedom to go into a classroom and not, you know, have have to worry as a parent, right, about getting shot. So, um, again, it, it's sort of a and the Birchers, you know, to just wrap it up a little. So the Birchers, I think, define freedom not as the freedom from want, right? That was FDR, one of FDR's definitions in 1944, I believe. Um, not as uh, the freedom to live life under your own precepts, right? According to your own kind of moral or religious precepts. Um, but as really the freedom to, an, an economic freedom to do what one will, you know, economically, basically, without unions, without cons- government constraints, uh, as well as uh, a moral uh, uh, imposition of a moral code based primarily, I think, on, on Christianity or a vision of Christianity. And so, you know, they had their own definition of freedom. Um, and uh, But as a, a, a colleague of mine uh, has written in a book of hers, uh, she defines this as a kind of ugly freedom. And... Um, and so, you know, freedom means, uh, it depends on how you define it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm always chiding conservatives, you know, we, we believe in freedom. You mean freedom of like women to control their own reproductive choice? Well, no, no, not, not that. Yeah. Uh, gays to get married. Oh no, 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 not yeah. those guys. Yeah. You know, it's like, well, then, you know, who, who are we talking about here? Or I believe in small government. Oh, you mean like we should reduce the uh, budget for the military? Oh no, 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 no. We need a massive... What about the what about the courts and jails? Oh no, we need massive government for for prisons. And okay, what about the border? Oh no, we got to spend a ton of money on the border. You know, it's like okay, so you don't actually believe in small government. What you believe is big government for the stuff you like. Yeah. Well, that's that's the central one of the central tensions in uh, conservatism, right? Modern conservatism that you know Reagan had a massive military expansion, right? Uh, and yeah, uh, right. And so it is hard to, you know, as George Will, a conservative columnist, I think, wrote 
yeah. either before or after the George W. Bush invaded Iraq, uh, he said, look, if I don't believe that government, the federal government is going to be equipped to do welfare in Des Moines, Iowa, why do I think that they're going to be equipped to rebuild the Iraqi state? Um, so I guess at least he was trying to be consistent, right? And saying, you know, I am for small government basically across the board, but that's a more, I guess, libertarian uh, vision. And of course, a conservative coalition goes far beyond uh, that vision. I, I love George Will. I'm not a conservative, but and, and Charles Krauthammer and <laughs> William F. Buckley. So let's, let's wrap up the kind of a bigger picture of the battle of ideas that goes on uh, that kind of drives culture wars starting with how somebody like William F. Buckley, again, I'm not conservative, but I admired him and I, I respected his intellect and making good arguments. How did he deal with the Birchers? How, do, how does somebody like a modern intellectual centrist conservative deal with the versions of Birchers today in, in MAGA country? Well, Buckley, and it's, um, it's funny, I actually had a, an excerpt of the book or basically adapted from the book in Politico on this question of Buckley and how he dealt with the Birch Society. And a lot of other people have, of course, written about Buckley and, and the Birchers. So I'm um, hardly the first. Um, but, uh, you know, there was this, this long time, a lot of people thought, well, Buckley really pushed the Birchers out. He wrote these editorial columns denouncing them. Um, and, you know, and a lot of historians in the past decade have pushed back on that and said, no, actually, Buckley never excommunicated the Birchers. He was really more going after Welch. And, you know, I think that latter view is basically true. You know, no one person had the power to excommunicate any group, especially tens of thousands of people. Um, look, Buckley, I think, was in the horns of a dilemma uh, in that, you know, he had a lot of ties to a number of Birch leaders like Ravillo Oliver. His mother was a Bircher. Um, and actually, at one point, I have this letter where I think it's Robert Welch writing to Bill Buckley saying, thank you to your mother, who's helping us set up a new chapter in North Carolina. She's such a great member or something like that. Um, and, um, and also Buckley's National Review readers, he uh, had some who's also subscribed to the Birch Magazine American Opinion. He didn't want to alienate um, them. At the same time, you know, he thought Welch and Welch's theories about Eisenhower were, you know, really crackpot. And he didn't and he also thought they were doing damage to the conservative electoral coalition that he was hoping would would come together. So, you know, he did try to um, uh, criticize and, and attack Welch, um, but he he and his team at National Review were careful to say we don't oppose to like the Birch rank and file. Um, and you know, I don't think they ever fully resolved that dilemma. Uh, and he also at the same time, though, he alienated a lot of Birchers as well. I mean, Birch leaders were very angry at him for uh, because they thought that he was going after fellow anti-communists, fellow you know conservatives in a sense in the Birch Society, as opposed to going after the true enemy, the liberals and the communists on the left. And so um, you know Buckley, there were costs to even him speaking out, even if he didn't you know excommunicate them or speak out in the way that uh, that he might have. So um, you know it was a a, a dilemma. That and I think you know Republicans never, most Republicans never quite resolved that dilemma. Most conservatives, you know, what do you do about the conspiracy theorists and you know the the more explicit racists? Um, how do you how do you handle them, especially if you need their support? And I think that that dilemma uh, remains. And and um, you know, uh, look at the silence about Trump, for example, from a lot of conservatives who probably knew better. Mm. Yeah, probably. Okay, last question. Big picture here on the future of the Republic. Are you worried? Uh, you know, there's often, ta often talk of, you know, civil war is coming. It's like, come on, really? Yeah. <laughs> well, I What do, would that yeah. even look like? Yeah. I, you know, um, yes, I'm worried. Uh, I, I don't see us in a civil war anytime soon. Um, but uh, I, you know, that's not to diminish my, my worries. <laughs> You know, it's look, it's very hard, I think, for democracy to succeed and to stabilize if one of the two major parties embraces conspiracy theories and does not agree on kind of basic facts, right? Like the sky is blue, right? Or just basic or the 2020 election was not stolen, right? There was no massive fraud. 
uh, or, you know, and you can go on down the line. Um, I am concerned that, you know, Trump, who is, remains the leader for the Republican nomination, um, I think has descended and has become more radical uh, over the past couple of years. I mean, in, in some ways more isolated. And uh, you can see it in his dinner with the white supremacist Nick Fuentes and the anti-Semitic rapper Yi. You can see it with the story today, I think, in the uh, New York Times, or I forget where, but uh, that he is uh, talking to um, uh, Loomis, uh, uh, um, basically a, a, a political operative with a history of bigoted statements, especially anti-Muslim commentary. I mean, there's really no, she's just, you know, really a, a, a flat out bigot. Uh, but Trump's recruiting her for his campaign. Uh, and um, and so, yeah, you know, I, I think you, you, you have to be worried and concerned. Um, but at the same time, on the other side, you know, a lot of the January 6th defendants uh, uh, are in jail. You know, they have been convicted. Some on uh, the Oath Keepers on charges of seditious conspiracy. You know, the Justice Department is uh, uh, doing its job. And, um, you know, and Trump is under all these investigations and maybe under more indictments. So, you know, the system is not totally broken, right? Our, our institutions are not nearly as strong in, in many respects as they were in the 1960s, but the mainstream media, uh, members of Congress, uh, uh, elements of the judicial system, the Department of Justice, you know, they do retain, I think, uh, uh, a certain authority and um, a certain resiliency that defends democracy. Uh, and, and so, you know, we're, we're obviously going to have to see, but um, it's a precarious moment, but it's not, um, I don't think we're on the verge of tipping into civil war. Uh, maybe I'm old enough to remember, you know, 68 and 72, yeah. Vietnam, yeah. Watergate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I took political science in 72, and our our te our text was basically the newspaper every day, and uh, and and it it sounded as bad as it sounds now, and it's like well, but we got through that okay, yeah. so yeah, yeah, maybe there's hope. <laughs> yes, yeah, no, I think that's a good perspective to have. Yeah, all right, here it is again, Birchers. It's a great read. How the John Birch Society radicalized the American right. Very good, Matthew. Thanks for coming on. What's your next project? What are you working on now? Well, thanks so much for having me. Uh, well, I'm just trying to promote uh, Birchers <laughs> right now. Uh, the book just came out a couple yeah, of weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what my next project is. Um, you know, I'm thinking, uh, I don't know. I, 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 I've got to decide if I want to write about the far right again um, in some capacity. And mm. if I don't, well, what, what direction do I go in? And if I do, what do I write about? Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm starting to think about it slowly. How, how about the far left? <laughs> yeah, you know, that, that's yeah. also there's some issues there. Absolutely. I mean